No, it may as well. I think it definitely it helps to sort of that help get my head the narrative a bit clearer because it's one thing to write the paper and another thing to like how you actually articulate this and explain to other people. So. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to kind of give yourself that basis, right? To sort of be able to make sense of everything else. Yeah, and that does take time. Quick question, by the way, I can't see you. Does that matter? I'm happy to just chat to you, but I guess your camera's not on, is that right? I see your Skype like image, but I don't see your video. I'm fine if you want to keep it that way. That's fine. I just want to let you know in case. Yes, I can. Cool. Nice to meet you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I see you in the Skype setting. I can see your little window and I can see what looks like your browser window. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Yep. I can see you up at the top. Yep. <laughs> Sounds good. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? So in case you haven't heard, NASA is heading back to Venus. So last month, the American Space Administration announced that it selected not one, but two Discovery class spacecraft missions from its competition to head to our closest planetary neighbor, these being Veritas and Da Vinci Plus. Uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, has also announced the Envision mission, um, which is designed to provide a holistic view of the planet all the way from its inner core to its outer atmosphere. So it's an incredibly exciting time for the exploration of Venus. And to help us unravel why scientists are so interested and why we're heading back there, we welcome Professor Paul Byrne to the channel. Paul, welcome to the channel. Thank you, Sam. My Thank you for taking the time. Uh, Professor Byrne is a planetary geologist at North Carolina, Carolina State University, although he's moving soon, um, and is interested in how and why planets look the way they do and exploring what our world can tell us about other planetary bodies and vice versa. On a more personal note, he's also a confessed Venus evangelist, or maybe that's Venusian evangelist. <laughs> so who better to help us understand why we want to be heading back to the second rock from the sun than Professor Paul Byrne. So Professor Byrne, first question, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask this. What are the fundamental tenets of being a Venusian evangelist? You know, is this... Can I expect you knocking on my door at five o'clock when I'm trying to eat my dinner saying only phosphine can save us? Is it, you know, sulfuric acid in the communion wine? Is it casting out perseverance and all its works? What What is it? What are the what are the tenets of being a good Venus evangelist? <laughs> well, it's definitely the third one. Uh, no, because of COVID <laughs> and social distancing, we, we now uh, we limit ourselves to pamphlets and to um, unsolicited <laughs> emails advocating why we should support Venus. Uh, the, the the basic course. So let me let me make a confession here. So I did. I got my PhD. My, my confession is very is, religious as well. So maybe it kind of feels like it's keeping right. <laughs> so I got my undergrad in geology, 
of Earth, right? Normal stuff. Planets didn't really feature at all. We knew they were there, but they didn't really form part of the curriculum. And then for my PhD, I studied Mars. I studied volcanoes on Mars. It turns out that there are these really, in fact, the biggest volcanoes we recognize are on Mars, and they're so big they've actually bent the crust down under their weight. Is, is, that, cool. is that Olymp Olympus Mons? I Olympus Mons, Rings yeah, which is the absolute... Mars. Olympus Mons is so... It's, it's one of the things where, I mean, I don't know why I'm talking about Mars, but I'll just say this. You can stand on the summit of the Olympus Mons volcano, and you can't see the bottom of it because the bottom of it is so far away, it's over the horizon. So all you would see <laughs> wow. is volcano, which is pretty wild. Um, and then I post doc on NASA's messenger mission, the first mission to orbit Mercury. And so uh, Mercury, I hold a very special place in my heart for Mercury because it's that little kind of small rocky world that doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. Yeah. Uh, but about five years ago, I started studying Venus. And I got to say, up until that point, I wasn't really that interested. I didn't know anything about Venus, except that it was... Really horrible conditions on the surface, uh, about the same size as Earth, didn't know all that much about it. But over the last five years, in fact, it took much less time than that, I began to realize just how many fundamental questions we had yet to answer, even yet to address, and that we just hadn't been doing it. That um, So right now, we have a spacecraft in orbit successfully operating at Venus. It's the uh, Japanese uh, space agency's Akatsuki mission. It's focused mainly on the atmosphere. Mm. Uh, prior to that, we had a European Space Agency mission called Venus Express that operated from 2006 until 2014, again, largely focused on the atmosphere. Mm. So it's not like we've not been learning about Venus with spacecraft, but they, they have hardly been a large, integrated, focused yeah. set of missions, you know, with sort of overarching big questions to answer. And the last time the United States sent a dedicated mission to study Venus was its Magellan mission, which launched from Space Shuttle Atlantis in 1989 mm. and operated until 1994. So it's been a long time since we've been to Venus, and it turns out that in that time, two really important things have happened. One is, well, actually three, but so I'll start with the third one. Our ability to do stuff in space has dramatically improved yep. in terms of our ability to navigate to places, to accurately control spacecraft very far away. I mean, to be able to take images of Pluto with the New Horizons probe, which took nine and a half years to get to Pluto for a three hour flyby <laughs> in that time and, and went into safe mode six days beforehand. So you can imagine what that would feel like when you've been waiting all this time. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, seeing something weird it. about red patches on on Pluto or something over the last couple of days. I don't know if that's related, but uh... I, well, 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 actually, actually, that's relevant insofar as we we because we're not going to get new data from a spacecraft from Pluto for quite some time. Even if we launch today, it's a decade away, and, yep. and we are not ready to do that. Um, people will go back through those data for for many yep. years to come, which is directly relevant to our study, which we'll, I guess we'll talk about at some point, which is that we've gone back to these decades old data for Venus. Yeah. Um, but the idea is we can do stuff a lot more capably now. We, you know, we have a helicopter operating on Mars, <laughs> even if it's a tech demo. Just the now, now, of that now is... and again, when it when it doesn't get smacked by a muon or something, I don't know what's been quite going on with it, but it it, it has I mean, operated it in an awesome eventually. fashion. But it has, yeah, yeah. And, and it will work until until they can't get it to work anymore. Yeah. We have two car-sized nuclear-powered rovers driving across the surface of Mars. Uh, we are building a quadcopter called Dragonfly to fly on Titan. So humans are getting pretty good. I mean, and look at the work that the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, um, what NASA is doing in terms of actually, you know, acquiring samples of meteorites and bringing or of asteroids and bringing them home. So that's changed. Two other things have changed uh, in the last 20 years, and particularly the last 10 years, we're discovering more and more of these extrasolar planets. So we call them exoplanets. They're planets that orbit other stars beyond the solar system, and we are right now. We are mo most capable of observing and finding the big ones because of the particular techniques we use mm. to find them. But we are really interested in looking for relatively smaller ones, which would be rocky ones, right? Which are, are Earth-sized, a little bit above, a little bit below the size of Earth. And ultimately, one of our fundamental goals um, as people is to understand are we alone and are there other Earth-like worlds in orbiting of other stars? And we are developing a better understanding of of how, what it takes to find these worlds and how to make sense of them. And what's really important to note is that right now, we do not, with our current level of technology, have the ability to distinguish a Venus from an Earth. Mm. Venus is about 95% the radius of Earth. That measurement error 
uh, encompasses the radius difference in terms of our ability to yeah. actually resolve something orbiting another star, which means every time you, you read a paper in which someone says, oh, we've discovered an Earth-sized world, that's fine. You may as well say we've discovered a Venus-sized world. <laughs> it's the exact same. And if anyone tells you... We're, we're so Earth-centric, Earth aren't we? Aren't we, we are, yeah. Well, yeah. and every time someone says we've discovered an Earth-like world, yeah. they're lying because we don't yeah. know yeah. of any other Earth-like worlds, meaning you have Earth-like conditions on the surface because we don't know enough about that yet. Yeah. So one of the reasons why Venus becomes so important to understand is because we have an Earth-sized world right next door that is anything like Earth, at least on the surface and in terms of its atmosphere, and, and likely its geolo geological history, at least over the last billion years, which is relatively recent in planetary terms. So by understanding Venus, we have a much better handle on, on what we'll make sense of mm. when we start discovering more and more of these worlds or, or building other stars. And the third thing that's changed is that in only the last five years, there have been some really interesting climate modeling studies, mm. which are being used and developed and are now becoming very sophisticated for worlds all over the place, including Mars, uh, that suggest that it is possible that Venus was Earth-like for most of its life. And I mean Earth-like, I mean water, I mean hydro hydrology, oceans, clouds. Mm. And what that means is right now we have two leading models to explain Venus. And one of those models is that Venus, which is subject to what we call a runaway greenhouse effect, which is to say that um, it, it is holding on to more energy than it's getting from the sun. Mm. Right. So it gets some sun uh, or some sunlight, but it doesn't reflect all that much of it. It actually traps a lot of it because of the nature of its CO2 atmosphere. So it's the same as you know, and greenhouse effect is really important. The greenhouse effect keeps Earth from freezing. Now, what we're doing as humans is we're pumping way too much greenhouse gas into the atmosphere too quickly for natural phenomena like plate tectonics and stuff to, to draw it down. So either Venus was wrecked from the beginning simply by virtue of where it was born. It just started off, Venus orbits about three quarters the distance from the sun that we do. Mm. That's not very much different. Mm. Now, if you, so it gets about one and a half times the amount, as amount of uh, sunlight as we do. Um, but, you know, the, the, the line for triggering a runaway greenhouse effect is somewhere around there. So it's possible that it started off and it was just from the beginning doomed. Yeah. You might have all the conditions and the material and the size to make it an Earth, but it never became an Earth because it was just that slightly too close, slightly too warm, went into the runaway greenhouse effect essentially from day one. Uh, Earth was a little bit farther away and by virtue solely of proximity, saved from that fate. And if that's right, and we'll talk later about how we'll find out, <laughs> if that's right, then that means that maybe there is a straightforward explanation or, or, or rule so if you find a world at a comparable distance to its stars, Venus, scaled for how much energy the sun is yeah, putting yeah. out, let's say, or the star is putting out, then you can probably reasonably expect it to be like Venus. And then maybe you can try and get evidence of its atmosphere. There are particular techniques we can use to try and, you know, sample, you know, gl glimpse what the atmosphere might be made of. Maybe we could go test that then by saying, okay, well, we expect it to be CO2 dominant, yeah, yeah, let's say. Yeah. All right, so that's, that's model one. Model two holds that, again, depending on how you tweak the dials in these climate models, it's possible that early Venus was able to generate a big cloud that covered about the, half of its surface, the, sur the side that faced the sun. I mean, it's not tidally locked, it does rotate, right? But the bit that faces the sun is cloudy. Mm. And that cloud might have allowed the planet to reflect more light than it was retaining and allowed, allowing the surface to become cool, to become clement for water that was in probably a steam-rich atmosphere to condense into oceans, to have a, a water-rich atmosphere. And... Because the, the assumption is Earth started off really hot, too, from what we call the magma ocean phase, you know, the brand new time zero when a planet gets born, the, the outer layer is liquid rock. Mm -hmm. And so the view is that Earth presumably was able to cool down, condense out its oceans and its atmosphere from this steam rich yeah. atmosphere. Um, maybe so, too, did Venus. And it did so with this big hemispherical cloud. <clears throat> and you couple that with a few things about, you know, with speed of its rotation and a bunch of things you can come up with climate scenarios for Venus with these pretty sophisticated models that hold that Venus might actually have been clement. Mm. And then at some point, perhaps within the last billion years, um, that number comes from the fact that we think the average surface age of Venus is about three quarters of a billion years old. We can talk about why we think that and, and how dramatically uncertain that is. <laughs> uh, but at some point in the last billion years, which again, to a normal person, a billion years is, you know, complex life on earth is a half billion years old plus yeah. or minus. so a billion years is, is an unfathomably long period of time but to a planet that's four thousand five hundred million years you know that's only the last 20 odd percent of its life mm. right most of it's before them so within the last billion years something catastrophic happened to venus's climate and the 
best explanation, it's not necessarily the only one, is that there might have been some dramatically powerful volcanic eruptions mm. that, are, that took place. It happens that we know major, and I'm not talking about Mount St. Helens or Pinatubo or Etna or, or Krakatoa the one or ice, Krakatoa or the one Iceland no one can say the name of. That's not true. <laughs> oh, I yeah. The one under the <laughs> There's a lot of places in Iceland that I can't say the names of. But... Yeah, to be fair, yeah, i got to say, so Icelandic people have no problem with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but... Those ones, I'm not talking about those ones. They are, they're normal. That's the sort of stuff Earth does all the time, figuratively. Like, geologically, it's routine. But we do know that, for example, the worst mass extinction in Earth history, recorded Earth history, happened around 250 million years ago. It's called the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. And 98% of all the stuff alive in the oceans died. And the and it's probably a complex set of things that are interrelated. But one of the biggest driving factors that we think was massive volcanism that produced what are called the Siberian traps. Trap is a is a word, I don't know, I think it might be Swedish but or, or Icelandic, but basically the trap word means when you get lavas and, and these lavas come out at, at biblical rates, they can produce kilometers thick stacks of lava. And then later they get eroded. And because the lava's come out in sort of packages that might be a few tens of meters thick, they end up eroding kind of a step or a staircase pattern. That's why they're called traps. But the point is that there are lots of these things around. We call them large igneous provinces. They're routine as well. They're common in Earth history. In the last 500 million years, there's been several dozen. Um, but we do know that when it's particularly big, there can be a deleterious climate effect because of the gases that come out of these eruptions, that the three principal gases that come out of volcanic eruptions are water, carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is a green is an ice house gas. It actually lowers the temperature for a while. And if you've ever heard of something called the year without a summer, that's why. But CO2 and H2O are greenhouse gases. In fact, H2O is much more potent than CO2. And if you dump all this stuff, and it's, again, you can tweak the diets in these models that say if you inject enough of this stuff in a short amount of time, you could potentially overwhelm any ability of your planet's climate to regulate itself, which Earth does through plate tectonics. Maybe Venus did too. And once you've done that, once you've overwhelmed it, it's game over. And that means that, one, it's self-inflicted. It's mm. not tied to where you're born. At least not obviously. Yeah. Two, you can't then look at other stars and find large rocky worlds orbiting them, large being Earth-sized, plus or minus, and just immediately go, well, it's this distance away. <laughs> Ergo, it's definitely one There's or the other. There's more going on. There's more factors involved. It's, which, like, where in nature isn't that the case? But True. but that's certainly one possible outcome, right? And the third thing is, if this is, in fact, the correct... By the way, we will talk a minute about how we will test this. There are things we can do to try and figure out which model is correct. Yeah. And it's probably model three we haven't thought of. But you know, <laughs> um, there are two working hypotheses. Third possibility, or the third, the third outcome of this, is that... If we're right about what happened to Venus, that it was it was a self-inflicted volcanic thing that did it, uh, those phenomena happen on Earth, and they will happen again. Mm. Our genius provinces, you know, they're rare, thankfully, on anything approaching human time scales or even you know biological time scales, but they're not infrequent, and uh, there's no reason to think that they'll, they'll stop. They will happen again. And maybe it's possible that Earth will get unlucky and there'll be several that'll go off at once for reasons we don't understand and, and the climate will be overwhelmed. So these are open questions we haven't answered yet, but they're the kinds of questions that studying Venus enables us to ask mm. and then with these missions enables us to begin to answer. It's very interesting. So so you're saying there's, there's these two leading models that Venus was essentially, you know, kind of shafted from the start, if that's the right way to put it. <laughs> yeah. And perfect. one that... It, it might have had water on the surface, could have potentially developed, you know, simple life on the surface. And then eruptions happened and it, and we got this runaway greenhouse effect where now it's hot enough to melt lead on the surface. You know, the, yep. the pressure is like being under the a thousand meters of ocean, I think. And yep. uh, and we have a an atmosphere which is full of CO2 and uh, and sulfuric acid. You mentioned and, and I guess it is the obvious question to go to go on with. How would we um, discriminate between which of those two models is right, if either of them? What what information would we be looking for? And, and maybe that's a, a big driver of why we're going back to Venus with these missions. Right. It, exactly. It is. And what's one of the most exciting things of this whole set of missions is they are beautifully complementary. So the two, we'll talk about the two NASA ones first. So the first one's called Veritas. I'll bring up, I'll bring up a, nice, uh, a nice picture for you. For you, Paul. Yes, Veritas. excellent. Thank you. And you and, and Veritas is a one of those contrived backronyms where they've picked the word and then they 
<laughs> I don't know how they did, actually which order they, they did. They it. take anyway, the Veritas second is, letter of the third word and the fourth letter. Of the yeah. Order, so, so Veritas is an acronym for, and the V is Venus. But I can't remember the rest of it is. So Veritas is a radar mission, but it's a very very powerful radar mission, and basically it's going to be, do what Magellan did, NASA's radar mission, but at a far higher resolution. So we're going to go from the kind of Viking images we had from Mars in the 80s to the kinds of uh, high resolution stereo camera, context imaging camera data we have in the 2000s. Uh, so Veritas will take um, detailed measurements of the surface in 2D with radar. You have to use radar. You can't use images, although I'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, you can't mainly use conventional imagery because you cannot see through the clouds. The cloud is a global layer of, of like you said, sulfuric acid clouds. They are a completely opaque to visible light, and you can't see the surface, so you have to use radar. Okay. Uh, same issue for Saturn's biggest moon, Titan. Right? You've got to use radar, which the Cassini spacecraft did. So basically, Veritas fires radar beams down through um, and will collect these data over several years. Uh, it will take two-dimensional image data, and it will also take three-dimensional data. And what's exciting about that is that Certainly those of us who study surfaces and map surfaces, the way you answer really uh, most questions is that you use 3D data because geology and geomorphology and geophysics, they are 3D processes. I mean, actually they're 4D processes, the time component as well. But the point is that basically you need to have accurate 3D data. As soon as you've gotten accurate 3D data for places like the moon or Mars or Ceres or Mercury, it's opened up a whole pile of new questions and, 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 and things for us to tackle. So it'll be no different. We do have topography, global topography for Venus right now, but it's not very good. Magellan's data are not that high resolution. Veritas will change that dramatically. Uh, Veritas is also going to look for changes in the surface uh, through what's called interferometric so, synthetic So before we jump radar. into before we dump, uh, jump into Da Vinci, Ver, uh, oh sorry, was that was that still Veritas? That was Veritas. But yeah, go ahead. Okay, what what information from that? So you, so we're going to get this uh, to topographical data. What what information mm -hmm. in there? It's going to be sort of the smoking gun for how it might have developed. What are the kind of intriguing things that we are likely to see in that um, in that data? And is that presumably much higher resolution than anything we've got of the Venus surface in the in the past? Absolutely, it is. And so, you know, when, for example, our study, we got to a point where we really can't answer very much more with what we have available. We have questions that we can answer. We got higher resolution data. We can start to see much more subtle changes in the surface. Yeah. Uh, we can see we get a much better handle on how things kind of relate to each other. Uh, vertically, which helps basically with stratigraphy, that basically helps us with understand time if one thinks it's on another. Yeah. And we can't really do that right now with Magellan. Um, so what uh, Veritas is going to do is it's going to give us this you know unprecedented high resolution image data of the surface. That's going to allow us. So one of the predictions or possibilities, if Venus did have a clement history, it had a climate that was Earth-like for a time, is that some of the oldest rocks that are preserved in the surface, perhaps, although this is a big unknown, this is what we ask, mm. uh, may date from that time. Mm. Uh, we do know that on Mars, for example, there's evidence of fluvial systems, right? That there are river channels. Mm. They are billions of years old. They are long dead, but they are pre preserved in the surface because they are scoured through the rock there. Mm. There are, we know, some very old rocks on Venus. They form what are called the tesserae. It's a word we use to describe about 7% of the surface that is resolvably older insofar as everything around the tesserae where, where we see them is sitting on top of them, right? yeah. which means the tesserae are the stuff that's oldest, locally oldest stuff. We don't know what the rock is. Um, the problem with calling tesserae isn't a geological word, at least not when we use anywhere else. Um, just because we have all these different parts that we kind of describe as tesserae, which is a word uh, originally coined by Russian scientists in the 80s, that doesn't mean that it's the same rock everywhere or that it's at the same history. It's just right now it's indifferent enough in terms of how it looks to the rest of the stuff, which is mainly just plains of lava. Maybe there'll be some fluvial stuff preserved in the Tessera, which you can see with Magellan, but you could see with Veritas. Now, that doesn't mean that there will be. And if we don't find it, that also doesn't mean there wasn't. It just means it's not preserved. But it's yeah. the kind of thing morphologically you mm. can look for. Veritas also has the ability to carry, it, it's going to carry a, a set of uh, instruments I mentioned that you can't photograph the surface from space. You need radar. There are some what we call windows, spectral yeah. windows in the atmosphere, in the infrared and in the near infrared that if you build your camera system just right, you can actually see through the clouds onto the surface. Now, for a variety of technical reasons, the images you get are very low resolution. Mm. Even if your camera is very good, you get such scattering in the atmosphere just because of what the atmosphere is made of that you actually can't see all this fine detail. But what you can do is you can get some, particularly if you take several images in different wavelengths all clustered around these few windows, you actually get enough data that you can combine them and start to work out some stuff about what the rocks might be made of. Ah. So Veritas is going to give us the first spectral 
chemical maps of the arena surface, which we just don't have anything like that at all, at all. Right? Wow. That's going to, it won't tell us necessarily what the rocks are, but it will tell us what kinds of mineralogy they might mm. have. And then by comparing and contrasting them, we can say, well, this is definitely different to that. Now, we think this one has got more iron than that. What does that mean? So that's it's not going to be the same as landing and taking samples or photographing above the surface. But anything you do on the surface or above the surface that's low enough for you to see the ground through the haze mm -hmm. uh, requires you operating on under temperatures where melt, uh, lead will melt. Yep. Or I like to call it it's a self-cleaning oven temperature. <laughs> so... The problem is, you know, until we get the technology that can last under those conditions, then we are working on that. Uh, we are limited by doing a lot of this stuff from orbit, and that's what um, Veritas is going to do. Mm. So chemical data will help us ask the right questions for whether or not there's any evidence of rock having ever been chemically influenced by water, for example, from an earlier period. It might help us look for geomorphological evidence mm. preserved in those oldest rocks. Again, not finding either of those two doesn't discount or refute the hypothesis. It just means it's not preserved. <laughs> finding it would be a very strong evidence yeah. in support of that hypothesis. Yeah. The other mission that NASA's picked is Da Vinci. Now, apparently, uh, I heard last week, they've dropped the plus. This was called Da Vinci Plus. I think now they're dropping it back to Da Vinci. Ah. Uh, we, we'll find more about this. They, you know, these things are brand new missions, right? Like yeah. We don't know yet. And Division Plus is a little more awkward, so I'm glad they dropped it, if they have. Uh, it too is another acronym that stands for a deep ascent something something. You can look it up on Google, right? It's another acronym. <laughs> um, and what separates Da Vinci De and Deep Veritas Atmosphere Venus Investigation of Noble Gases Chemistry and Imaging, apparently. Why it just verily rolls off the top. <laughs> uh, exactly. So, so this is what separates Da Vinci and Veritas is that Da Vinci... Uh, has, it has an orbiter as well, and it'll do some, it actually it'll be similar in terms of its instruments to what the Japanese orbiter is doing today, mm -hmm. which is good because the longer length scale you have for observations in terms of, like, or rather, the longer the time scale you have looking at observations, the better you have a handle on how things change seasonally and, and annually. Um, but the star of the show for Da Vinci is this probe. And in this image here, we see this kind of artist's impression of what this probe will look like. Yeah. It comes in with a, with a heat shield because it's coming in fast and it through a series of maneuvers, we'll jettison the heat shield, it'll jettison the back shell, a drogue chute comes out, then the main chute comes out, um, and it reveals this, uh, this probe, this metal thing about a meter across, chock full of instruments, and it has a camera in the bottom, in incorporated entirely in this shell. Now, an interesting thing about Venus, one of its most interesting characteristics is that at around 55 to 60 kilometers, above the clouds, the temperature and pressure are about that of room temperature and pressure on Earth. In fact, it's the only other place in the solar system we know of where if you, were, for example, were in a big you know, aerial platform, a big airship, and there was a gondola and you could stand outside, you could stand outside wearing just a T-shirt. Now, you would need some sort of you know, scuba gear Breathing right? because yeah, because you will quickly asphyxiate. It's 96.5% it's CO2. But you would be fine temperature-wise and pressure-wise. Mm -hmm. The only place that's room temperature in, in, the, in, the, in the solar system is the atmosphere of Venus at around 60 kilometers up. Um, however, it gets worse from there. And so the design of this probe is that this big metal thing is basically a pressure vessel. And it's designed to fall through, to descend through the Venus atmosphere over the course of about an hour. And in doing so, as it passes through various levels in the atmosphere, we'll take repeated high resolution, detailed chemical measurements of the atmosphere and measure a bunch of different things out there, including noble gases. I'll come back to why that's important in a moment. What's really interesting about how you do this kind of thing for Venus is that after about 60 kilometers or so, you jettison your parachute. And that's not shown in this image, probably because it freaks people out. But basically, at around an altitude of 60 kilometers, you drop the parachute and you just free fall yeah. because the atmosphere starts to get so thick that your terminal velocity, the speed you will accelerate to and then stop accelerating at, is about 30 miles an hour. And they can build the probe to withstand that and it basically falls onto the ground at 30 miles an hour. Uh, in other words, throwing something onto the surface of Venus from about 60 kilometers down is about the same as throwing a scientific instrument off the side of a boat. <laughs> It, it, you you don't put parachutes on sensors we put onto the seafloor. Yeah. We just let them fall, yeah. and we build them to withstand a collision of around eight meters per second. Um, so that's what this thing will do, which is just wild to me. Um, so basically, what it's going to measure, and amongst other things, are a set of noble gases. And the reason the noble gases matter, right? So argon, xenon, krypton, helium, is because and and they have a lot of different isotopes as well. So there's there's lots of different measurements we're taking. 
and we'll take them, we being the team, the humanity, we'll take these measurements at different altitudes. And the reason it matters, the reason noble gases are important is because noble gases, you might know, they don't chemically react to anything. Not really. And it turns out we've learned this from Earth and we've learned this for other worlds too. Noble gases are a really, really good record of what happened inside your planet early on. And also how much you got your planet got born with things like helium and water and a bunch of other gases. And so basically what happens is some of these um, is noble that gas isotopes... Their, is that because of their lack of reactivity and therefore yeah, their essentially abundances yep. stay similar? Is that is That's that... exactly what it is. Okay. And it's the ratios of those abundances that da Vinci will pay particular attention to because you get certain different amounts of different isotopes of, of, of one noble gas who won't chemically react, but those isotopes will radioactively decay. Yeah, yeah. And then you'll get you know a certain amount of what's called the parent isotope, a certain amount of the daughter isotope. And by looking at those ratios of these gases, you have a really accurate clock mm. of what happened when in terms of how much stuff the planet was born with how much stuff came out of the interior early on, how much helium did it have, yeah, how much yeah. water did it have, how much of that has been lost. We've known for decades, decades, before Magellan we've known that the noble gases are the key to understanding Venus's climate history. Measuring them is extremely difficult or has been in the past because of technological issues. Yeah. How do you make a, a mass spectrometer, which is the kind of thing that's gonna measure this, that's small enough that you can fit into a pressure vessel that's about a yard across. That's going to survive and take several measurements and then beam those data back within an hour. I mean, that's that's a pretty technically complex thing to do. Mm. Da Vinci has now done that. It will do this. It will fly. It will take those measurements. And just those measurements alone, like it's going to take Veritas quite some time to build up the global image data that we need, the global radar image data. And we'll talk about Envision in a moment too, which is ESA's mission. Mm. Um, it's going to take us longer to get to the surface and take in situ mineralogical, petrological measurements to ingest samples into a lander and process them the way we're used to doing on Mars, for example. That's still quite a ways away. But over the course of one hour, the data that the Da Vinci probe will capture will put a massive tick in a really big box yeah. we have of yeah. open questions of Venus. Because it won't tell us definitively, I mean, what measurement does, but it will be dramatically helpful in terms of our understanding of whether it's model A, you know, shaft from the beginning, yeah. or model B, mm. paradise, turn it to hell. We will have huge additional insight into which of those two scenarios just from that measure, those set of measurements over that hour. So, so does, that's one of the most exciting things about Da Vinci. So does this help to explain that sort of... You, when, when you opened, you said that there's been this huge gap between, you know, the interest in Venus in the 70s and the 80s. Think about the, the Venera spacecraft from Russia that landed on the surface, only lasted an hour. I what I found was really cool about that, actually, was they were saying it's the silicon electronics that get flooded rather than the thing actually melting. So it's still yes. sort of sat there on the on the surface being like, I, I have can't. this artist's impression of what I imagine. Yeah. This is an image like, <laughs> and that's like, so that's one of the venerable landers. They are still there. They're not melted. They were mm. made of titanium. Titanium's melting points like 2000 Celsius. Mm. They don't work, but they're there. You could go and you could put a few velvet. Okay, the velvet wouldn't work. You could put steel or, well, that wouldn't work either. You could put iron cables around the thing maybe and say, look, this is a, you know, a, 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 a tourist piece now. Yeah. It's still there. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Because of the heat, yeah. Yeah, because the, the silicon electrons have been flooded with the heat, the electrons jumping across the band gap and all this uh, yep. this sort of That's business. Exactly it. But does does the gap, is that now explained why we haven't been back to Venus by the fact that we didn't have the technology to answer these questions that were interesting and now we do, it's worth returning? Because it humans are obviously pattern-seeking animals and it, it struck me that we got the phosphine results last year and now suddenly these two Venus missions turn up are we are we being reactive? But maybe it's more that the technology has come to a a natural point where it is worth going back to be able to answer some of these questions. Like you said, there's applications for understanding the Earth's evolution, um, potentially uh, impacts on global warming, uh, applications for looking at uh, extra solar uh, extra solar planets, which is a, obviously a big area of study at the moment. Have we have we simply reached a technological point where it's worth going back, and therefore we see these missions now coming back into focus where we seem to have been very Mars centric over, uh, over recent years. Yeah. No, no. Okay. No, the Good. technology for this has been available for at least 10 years. So why, uh, I mean, so every why year, so literally. long then? Why, why have we not been interested? I don't know. I genuinely don't know that. I have some ideas, but I don't know the answer to that question, but, mm. but nothing these missions 
So, for example, we mentioned a minute ago about how the silicon electronics are just will get borked for the for the temperature down yeah. there. Um, there's been some really exciting work coming out of several places, but for example, NASA Glenn, which is a research one of NASA centers in in Ohio, they've been working on high temperature silicon carbide electronics, and yeah. what they've shown is they can now make very simple trans. In fact, not even simple. They had a few tens on breadboards. But two years ago, now they're up to like a thousand transistors on a breadboard, and they can get them to work for about as long as six months yeah. at, at at ambient Venus temperature pressure conditions. You know, in the next 10, 20 years, we will see spacecraft that will last for months, if not years, on the surface of Venus mm. because they are designed to. And again, it's not so much even the pressure. We can build to, to, to nine and a half megapascals, which is what the pressure is. It's about a thousand times room, pre- room temperature. Um, or sorry, it's 90 times room, te- room pressure. Um, but the, the idea basically so much is it's not the pressure, it's the temperature. And, yeah. and, and, and like you said, it's the electronics too because we can make other devices function at high temperature depending on what we make, we make them of. Um, and of course, you can imagine that high temperature electronics will have kind of implications for you can put them into, you know, aerospace applications and you can put them into firefighting and you can think of all the other commercial yeah. and a perfect example of how NASA will design something out of necessity that suddenly has a host of applications yeah, yeah, in all yeah. kinds of normal day to day life. Right? You so, can put so them we'll, in start, your we'll start to get electronics in, in uh, turbine blades and things to optimize Absolute, their operations, yeah, yeah. this kind of thing. Manage, you know, high, temp, high, high bypass ratio jet turbine yeah, engines. Yeah. You can stick so you can put a camera in your oven for some reason. <laughs> like, you you could. Yeah. But the point is you can do all this stuff. Um, so it's, I mean, so so it's not to say the technology hasn't been enabled. Of course it has. But these missions have been proposed for several years. This is at least the third time I'm aware of that both Veritas and DaVinci have been proposed. Mm. And in Vision as well, this is the third time it was proposed, mm. which is pretty normal. Often missions are not, in fact, very rarely are missions picked in their first go. More often than not, they're picked their second or third attempt. Yeah. Um, so technology has helped, but it's not the reason why. Phosphine is also not the reason why notwithstanding the fact, and I kind of believe this, is no such thing as bad publicity. Um, the phosphine dis- discovery detection came out very late in these missions developments. Uh, Veritas was never going to measure anything in the atmosphere, so Veritas isn't going to focus on, on phosphine. Um, apparently, uh, Da Vinci, although I don't know this, I think Da Vinci will look for phosphine-bearing species, uh, basically molecules, compounds in the atmosphere that uh, contain phosphorus, that include phosphine. But da Vinci was going to do that anyway. It's yeah. got the capability of measuring those things. And they locked that capability in their proposal much a, a long time before phosphine. So it's certainly, I think, the phosphine detection, and I can show here, this is um, Alex Weiss's uh, article uh, from earlier this year. There's been as many papers refusing or debating yeah. the phosphine detection as there are supporting it. It's still not in any way a settled issue. We had, uh, However, we had Sarah Seeger on the channel to, to discuss it when I when it came out and then it sort of went away and then it came back and mm-hmm. I'm not really sure what the status of it is at the moment, to be honest. It, it's uncertain. It's yeah. very uncertain. Yeah. And um, and I've been saying, I've, I wrote about this, I interviewed people, we are not going to know the answer for this mm-hmm. until we get into the Venus atmosphere. Yeah. No amount, it's certainly you can try and look for it from Earth and, and people are and should do that. But a non-detection doesn't necessarily mean it's not there. It just means that something is happening that late right now, it's the conditions are not right for us to detect it. It's not definitive evidence that it's not there. If we go into the atmosphere and measure it and find that it's not there, that's pretty definitive. Yeah. And then we got to go and make sense retroactively of what those initial discoveries were. Or we find that it is there. Or, and here's the thing too, Da Vinci, as powerful as it's going to be, and it is going to be powerful in terms of what it's going to tell us and how it's going to reshape our understanding of Venus, it's still a single profile through the atmosphere. We have assumed that under about 100 kilometers altitude, the chemically the atmosphere is well mixed, which means you can yeah. sample it here or there yeah, and get yeah. basically the same answer. We don't know that for sure. We also have very poor control. Let okay, me phrase it the normal way. We, we don't understand really well at all the extent to which various layers in the atmosphere mix. So, for example... So um, what you're saying, things, Paul, is we need 100 da Vinci's, really, and then we get some I, sort I, of sampling. I, I can't but... emphasize enough. <laughs> we didn't solve Mars with two big landers, yeah, sample yeah. return. Uh, you know, we're going to need several missions over over decade time frame to begin to answer these questions. And, and in fact, one of the most exciting ways you could explore Venus is with a balloon, and we could talk about that in a couple of minutes, too. Mm-hmm. Um, so back to your question of why, why now. So phosphine, I'm sure, didn't help or didn't hurt. Yeah. And certainly the new technology didn't hurt, but it's not either of those two. And I don't know what it is. Um, is is it I that have we've th- been very life, life, searching for life-centric and Mars seemed like a more viable candidate? Is that 
Well, on that very note, it is. I don't know again if these are causally related, but on that very note, the Magellan mission ended in 94. Mm. NASA stood up a, a, a program to fund scientists to analyze Venus data, which NASA does routinely for spacecraft data. Um, and they set one up for Venus. And normally these grants, this is pretty much how a lot of the federal government works in terms of funding. Normally these grants maybe last for say three years. And so the story goes, this is well before my time, but so the story goes is that people got funded on, on these three year grants. And after the second year, NASA canceled the program, mm. including the third year funding. And if you do that to a program, people have to eat and yeah, they will go yeah. to where the money is. Yeah, and they so yeah. they stop doing Venus. Yeah. And as a result in the US, the Venus community has been quite small for a long time. Now it started to grow in the last few years. People like me have joined and I've seen other people join with me and we've been able to spread the word and get other people interested. It's not me though. I mean, there were others becoming, you know, before I joined, but, but not all that long before. And I don't know why, except that every time a Venus mission was proposed and then someone wrote about it and then it wasn't selected. Yeah. It helped, you know, kind of a bit of, was, bit of demoralization maybe about. Yeah, that, exactly. You know. And kind of people began to go, well, how come we're not sending missions to Mars, you know, to Venus? Well, you know, what's the rationale for it? But after the Magellan mission ended in 94 and these and these programs ended at around 96, in that same year, 96, meteorite ALH84001 turned up, which is a meteorite that was found in Antarctica in 94 that was found to be determined to be from Mars and that was proposed mm. to maybe have evidence for a biological fossil. Yeah. inside it yeah. fossil bacterium now most people myself included now i don't think think that's a biological fossil i think it's something naturally occurring mm -hmm. called diagenesis mm -hmm. uh, but if you've seen the movie contact yeah the fantastic movie with jodie foster, jodie foster um yeah. there's there are scenes in that movie where bill clinton is talking about you know the events in the movie yeah and he's giving a press conference about this is an amazing discovery and stuff and and they've caught him out in times and they've put him into the versus scenes those press conferences were taken from around the time in 1996 when that thing was discovered and there was this massive shift of public interest to mars mm. not just in terms of mars but its potential habitability potential house yeah, habitability yeah. and then of course although these missions were already in the works and they're having other mars missions launched although they failed in the 1990s to mars that then culminated the following year with the Pathfinder mission, which saw the Sojourner rover, but the size of a large toaster, drive, and for the first time, drive on Mars. And then from that, we had like Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, we've had Curiosity, Perseverance, Maven, which is an orbiter that's there right now. We've had Phoenix. We've had Insight, which is there right now as a seismic mission. It helped shift the focus to Mars. Mm. And I, I can't help but think that there's some kind of causal link. It's not that people decided Venus wasn't worth doing. But there was not enough of a critical mass, particularly in the US, to drive NASA to do a Venus mission. And the, the, the events were overtaken by the possibility that Mars might have been once a habitable or inhabited world. Okay. And, of course, and, we, and we can roll out these nice rovers there as well, I it, guess. And, at, well, at, you can photograph the surface yeah. of Mars from space yeah. easily. Yeah. And you can have rovers in that, you know, Spirit and Opportunity were supposed to last 90 days each and and, and Opportunity was declared lost in 2018. Mm. Actually, it was 2019 when it was declared lost. Mm. Supposed to last for 90 days in 2004. <laughs> Lasted 15 years, 13 years, yeah, 14 years. So the point is that, yeah, Mars in some respects, I mean, it's not right to say Mars is easy because it's really not. Mm. But it is easier than Venus. Yeah. At least on the surface. Now, like I mentioned, you can fly a balloon in the atmosphere at around 55 or 60 kilometers. And in fact, humans have done that. There were yeah. two Russian missions called the Vega 1 and 2 missions in 1995. Uh, the Vega missions were, were really impressive because basically they were actually Halley's Comet missions, but they were using Venus as a gravity assist. And so obviously the, you know, Russia decided, well, why don't we just do some stuff in Venus while we're at it? And so they took two French built balloons and they deployed them into the atmosphere. I mean, if you look at the, the pictures describing how the Da Vinci probe come in, yeah. the ones of the balloons are, are even crazier because this thing comes in and then it has to inflate on the way down and it drops this parachute and then it's got to you know once it's inflated it's got to drop the inflation system because it's heavy and then it kind of rises back up to its, its buoyant <laughs> neutrally buoyant uh, altitude really really impressive but the point is we had two balloons in the 80s that operated for about 44 hours each in fact they probably operated longer um, but the reason we got data from them only for spanning about 44 hours is because the things that were relaying the data back to earth were on their way to Hades comet and went out of range mm -hmm. I mean, they wouldn't have lasted very much longer, but they were battery powered. You know, they didn't even have the ability to recharge. I mean, these things were, you know, they were really simple. And the actual electronics package hanging off the balloon was about a meter long and very simple. You know, the, uh, temperature, uh, temperature, pressure, that kind of stuff. But 
we absolutely today have the technology to fire a balloon in Venus. Yeah. We just haven't done it yet. So, is there a reason that, that is there a reason that there's this seeming um, segregation between Russia and the West on on Venus, or is that is that a little bit superficial and actually it's not as real as I'm making out it is in my head? I again, I don't know why though. It's definitely true that. Russia landed successfully several times and recorded sounds and chemical data, mm. even, I think, seismic data, which is a different conversation. I think we detected a break on Venus. Um, and, uh, and, and photographs, yes, they, through the Venera probes, which were remarkably powerful and capable uh, tanks, big-ass, heavy titanium tanks that just were dropped onto the surface. I mean, again, once you get to about 60 kilometers, you have a big uh, drag plate that slows the thing down, uh, you have a big crush ring. You can see in that image there, there are kind of these jagged things on the bottom. Those jagged teeth are on the crush ring. Mm. They, they stop the thing spinning on the way down. Uh, fun fact, that is uh, Venom 13. I think it was 13. It might have been 13 or 14. You'll notice that there's sort of a weird kind of, you know, um, lunate looking thing there in the middle, a kind of crescent shaped mm. thing. That's this big kind of, uh, I can't remember if it's titanium or steel, but it's a big metal cover over their imaging system, which is then jettisoned once it lands to protect it on the way down. And the thing on the left is this sort of like spring mounted arm thing that flips out and has a spring in it. And it hits the ground. And then by measure of how much the spring is deflected, you can get a sense of how strong the ground is. But we use that kind of technology right. on Earth all the time. It's quite a simple idea. Um, and on one of the, uh, and, and each of them had a camera on each side. So they took nominally a 180 degree panorama for a 360. One of them, I think on 13 didn't work. So I don't remember if it was 13 or 14 because they, they were close in time together. Anyway, for one of them, Jettison the lens cap, the arm slammed down onto the lens cap. So it went all the way to Venus to measure the compressibility of the lens cap. But, you know, <laughs> the, the swings and roundabouts when it comes to That's so equation. disappointing. I know, yeah. Although the other one on the other side worked, which is good. Hmm. But the idea is, yes, NASA never had a lander on Venus. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that NASA wasn't looking at Venus. Um, the first successful interplanetary flyby ever of all time was the Mariner 2 mission, which was a NASA mission, and it flew past Venus in 1962. So... It's not that NASA didn't look at Venus. It flew the Pioneer Venus mission, which a lot of people haven't really ever heard of. It operated from 1978 until 1990. I mean, this thing lasted in, in, in Venus orbit for 12 years. And it carried, it actually was two missions. It was the orbiter and there was sort of the probe version. And there was one big probe and three small ones. And one of the small probes they were like Da Vinci, but just much less complicated, much less capable. But again, doing, you know, measurements of temperature and pressure through, through the atmosphere. Um, one of the small probes actually survived the landing and broadcast data for a little while until its electronics got baked, which they weren't planning on and weren't expecting, which mm. is amazing. So it's not like NASA didn't look at Venus, but it, and, and it's also not true to say that the Russians didn't look at Mars. The Russians mm. did try to land and they did successfully land. And they even tried to rove on Mars, but that didn't work. But I think it's fair to say that, yes, the preponderance of attention that Venus has gotten has been from was from the Soviet Union. Mm. Um, and why that is, I heard a rumor, well, not even a rumor, a, a wild supposition that apparently one of the benefits of going to Venus is that you can test uh, atmospheric entry heat shield technology. Yeah. Um, and the reason the Russians wanted to do that more than perhaps the Americans is because the Russian supercomputers weren't as capable mm. as the American supercomputers in characterizing atmospheric entry for nuclear warheads, for ICBMs. Mm. And so they could go. I don't know if that's remotely true. No, it's, I, it's, it's sad sounds kind of cool, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you, how, you, how you test that idea. But it's true. Most of the exploration and really the core stuff about the surface. So again, let me be clear. Venus surface is really hard. Venus atmosphere is tricky but doable. Mm. And Venus orbit is easy. It's no more difficult than orbiting anywhere else. I mean, it, it, none of this is easy, but relatively speaking. Um, there's so that's there's some so really interesting concept art actually of the, and I'm sure you've come across this. Of um, obviously, you, you as you were saying, it's very difficult to run the silicon electronics on the surface. So there was a, I think it was a NASA competition they put out a couple of years ago to build these kind of steampunk. I don't know if I can mm -hmm. bring up a nice picture of them. Um, these steampunk rovers, right? Yeah, the steampunk like Venus rovers that that sort of yeah. operate spring loaded and. Uh, without complex electronics so there's all sorts of um weird little if the if the i mean uh, these things really are 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 yeah they're bold these ideas i right? think it's struggling um, to load the images let's see if i can bring up some 
images instead. Here we here we go. Yes. Wind powered rovers and all yeah, these kind yeah, of kind absolutely. of odd, oh it's gone back to there, but I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll leave that image up. You can kind of see it. Yeah, so so one of the things there's a bunch of issues with with operating under those temperatures. And to be honest, even if we get high temperature electronics, um, memory is going to be proving is proving to be difficult in terms of like you know non volatile memory on board, so that you're not having to broadcast it all the time immediately. Mm. Camera systems they're hard. Power, how do you power something? And there are some really, again, bold ideas for how you might actually power something uh, on Venus where power generates heat and your problem is heat and how you dump waste heat mm. um when you have a you reservoir have... that you're trying to dump to which is already right. massively hot how do you get when over it, that yeah problem? exactly it's like you know i lived in texas for a year and a half and if you go out in the peak of summer it just don't you are the <laughs> coldest thing out there right because your yeah. body temperature is lower than the prevailing ambient yeah. air temperature so yeah. you become a heat sink yeah. which yeah. is one of the reasons why it's just gross um and so that's the issue with these things too um it, it's helped a bit if they are all at ambient temperature but then the issue is still how you're going to power it so that's why people have proposed wind power and not even wind power in terms of like you know operating electronics but maybe even driving uh transmission systems to legs or arms or some kind of mobility systems so that you could rove mm -hmm. um and the idea of these sort of real classics like victorian steampunk ideas is that basically the entire thing is mechanical mm -hmm. there's no wires or electronics at all there's not even any electronics or electrics it's simply just mechanical and whether it's weights and springs and how you would do it this thing would move around my my guess tells me that those are not going to be sufficient to do the mm -hmm. kinds of science we want to do and i think what we'll end up doing is developing high temperature electronics and high temperature batteries yeah. and high temperature yeah. camera systems but Roving on Venus would open up this world in a way. Like one thing I didn't mention that the, the Da Vinci probe is going to do, the one that's going to drop to the atmosphere. Mm. So it's going to take all these measurements of noble gases and a bunch of other things too. It also has a camera sticking at the bottom. I mean, it's it's not it's looking out through the bottom. It's inside the pressure vessel. And this camera, so, is so it's going looking to, down on the surface as it's it comes down, down through the right. as it's coming down, okay. and it's taking images in the in the near infrared in these windows I mentioned, mm. and. Basically, what we expect is that it's going to come over one of these. I mentioned these tessera earlier, right? These are older. They're highly deformed. They are weird. We don't know what they are, and we don't know that they're all the same. They're probably not. But one of them is called Alpha Regio. It's in the southern hemisphere. This is its Alpha region is what its name translates to. Um, but it just that's where the team has selected that they're going to drop the probe in. This region is a thousand kilometers across, so it doesn't matter where they land because the, the uncertainty, the, what we call the landing ellipse, is going to be much smaller. Remember, it's not actually going to land; it's going to like land on. It's going to yeah. it might bounce, right? Yeah. But the point is, it doesn't. Remember, it doesn't need to work on the surface. It just needs to work all the way down until as close to the surface as they can get the data off before it makes contact. Yeah. Um, but it's going to take photos, near infrared photos, and it's going to photograph the surface from above. We we have never seen Venus with a regular optical image from above. We have radar, that's coarse, and even Veritas and Envision, which will have extremely powerful radars, will still give us perhaps a few meters per pixel now. Because, because over, of the wavelength of the radiation that you're, exactly, you're dealing with. Exactly, yeah. because the wavelength of the radar. Uh, now, you know, I cannot emphasize enough, that's good, you know, if we, if, even if we get some, like for Mars, we'll get global resolution perhaps at 10 meters per pixel. Mm. And we might have a few places where it's much higher resolution, like high rise from Mars, where we can see things like the landers. Yeah. That's going to, that is going to revolutionize our understanding mm. of Venus. Mm. But Verita or Da Vinci coming in as it, as it kind of comes through the, the haze and the, the ground starts to swim into view is going to start seeing surface features, depending on how, how long it can take photos until it makes contact at resolutions that will be functioning the same as a lander, right? They'll be yeah, outcrop yeah. scale, they'll be yeah. at the scale of a human would see. We've never seen the Venus surface from that, from that scale or from that vantage point before. And one of the things we really want to do as scientists is measure the tessera and work out what they're made of. And the best way of doing that is to land on the tesserae. The problem is the tesserae are really rough, we think. They're a lot more rugged than what we know most of the surface planes to be. And so it's way too risky to ever want to land on, on the tessera. However, if we have images of them from the Da Vinci probe, that will help engineers in the next 10, 20 years say, okay, well, now mm. we know what they actually look like on the scale yeah. of a lander. We might be able to actually make a lander that would survive landing on the test, right? So those images are going to, even for the one place, it's like the images that the Huygens probe gave us as it went through the Titan atmosphere. 
they're going to revolutionize our understanding of this world. And and ultimately, we won't be satisfied with one. We're, we'll do more. We'll do balloons. And ultimately, we will absolutely do rovers. And those rovers will operate for months. And they'll be weird looking armored APC like they'll, they'll, you know, they'll be to Percy what, you know, a tank is to a, a Mini Cooper. Right. I mean, it's going to look different. <laughs> But the idea is they will give us a sense of what the ground looks like at a scale, at a human scale that 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 for the foreseeable future will not happen for humans. It's going to be a very long time, if ever, that suited humans will, will be comfortably operating on the surface of Venus. It just it's, it seems quite a long way away. But we can do it with robots. And that is going to allow us to actually explore individual outcrops of Venus and at, begin to ask the kinds of questions for, for Venus that we are beginning to ask for Mars. Mm. Um, including, you know, was there ever an inha- habitation? Right? The whole point of the Perseverance rover is that it's in Jezero Crater. It's looking at an el- ancient delta, one of the best places we can think of where uh, the signature, the biochemical signature of life might be preserved if it was ever there. Um, we don't even know where we would start yeah. looking for that kind of thing on Venus, or even if we should, right? We don't know which of those two models is correct, whether it was Shaft from the beginning model or Earth-like for a while. And even if it was Shaft from the beginning, it's still going to be critical to understand what the surface is made of, how it formed, how long ago it was active, what are the test ray. Mm. These are basic questions that we, we need this kind of technology to answer. And I'm hoping that these two missions will set us on that road in the coming decades to actually answer those questions. It's fascinating stuff. So as we come to the end of this, because I really appreciate you taking the time to go through this with us, Paul, but I don't want to keep you for, for too much longer. I know you must be very busy. Um, what are the time scales with this? When can we, uh, when are these missions going to be up there? When can we expect to be, be getting the, uh, you know, the beautiful YouTube live streams like we had for Perseverance <laughs> yeah. and such, where we can watch these things getting into the Venus atmosphere. What, what are we talking about here? And in terms of getting data back and, uh, getting the analysis underway. Right. So some of this is still up in the air. It, it, it's got um, so the COVID pandemic has kind of thrown a lot of things mm. into in uncertainty. Um, these missions that were selected, both the Envision mission, which is again like a radar mission, which also, by the way, the, the Envision mission, I didn't say this, it's also going to carry uh, similar uh, spectral instruments to what the Veritas mission mm. will do to get us spectral data from space. Envision is also going to carry a radar sounder. It's going to be able to look as perhaps several hundred meters into the surface. Oh, to wow. see what's under the lava flows we see. I mean, that's, that's just doing that. We've done that for the moon and for Mars, and we've seen some really cool things. So um, they now enter what's called the detailed design phase. So for all the work the teams have done, now the actual hard work starts. Hmm. So they're going to develop it, and they'll, there are various phases that these missions are broken into. We can expect their launch dates for the U.S. missions, for Veritas and Da Vinci, to be somewhere around 2028 or 2029. Just because of NASA's budget... Um, the availability of launch windows and launch vehicles. Um, their very ambitious Dragonfly mission is going to launch, I think, in 2026. That's going to take a lot of out of attention. That's the rotor, rotorcraft uh, quadcopter for Titan. Um, the Europa Clipper mission is going to launch in maybe 25. I'm not actually sure when it's going to launch. So NASA is going to be busy for the next few years. And doing one big planetary launch a year is a lot when you consider all the other things NASA does. Mm. So that's part of it. Um, and that part of it is just the time it takes to design these things and build them and test them and integrate them. Um, but we're talking about latter half of this decade. Mm. And we should get the data back, depending on the particular way they're going to do this, a variety of ways you get to orbit and how you can aero break and all kinds of things. Um, certainly by 2030, we'll start getting data back, possibly, mm. probably sooner than that. Um, but it it just takes time. These are not fast turnaround missions. Each one is bespoke. So we have to be a bit more patient. Um, uh, literally on Twitter today, someone was making the point, uh, we've waited this long, we can wait a few years more. Yeah, yeah. Um, which gives us enough time to revisit those old Magellan data and start to ask new questions and take new a new look at old assumptions and see what we can see it, say about these worlds. Because that way we'll be in the best position then to actually ask the right questions when we get these new data back from you Venus. get analysis techniques and uh, and such set up ready for that, exactly. for that information. And I can continue spreading the good word of Venus <laughs> and, and bring more of them to my flock, convince other people who study other worlds as well to start looking at Venus as well. It does. It gives us uh, time to get the congregation together. Um, excellent. So, so, Paul, final question, and I'm going to turn slightly from a, a scientist into a journalist here, if you'll if you'll permit me. Um, what do you expect or, or what do you hope that will be found? What would be 
what would be a beautiful smoking gun for you to be found on the on the surface or in the clouds in the atmosphere of Venus? So I will be happy with whatever we find, but there is a tragic romance to the idea that you once had an Earth-like world that got ruined. And if we were to find evidence of fluvial features, of evidence of water flowing on the surface, preserved in some really old rocks, if we found chemical evidence for rocks that cannot form under today's conditions, say like sediments that, you know, on Earth we attribute to water, and we definitely know that's the case for Mars, the stuff in Jezero Crater and in Gale Crater were both deposited near or under water. Um, finding something like that or chemical evidence from the atmosphere that says, you know what, this world was, was Earth-like for a long time, its noble gas abundances matched that of Earth, uh, it was born with the same amount of water, it was presumably degassed the same way, it was clement for billions of years and then something went wrong. You know, I'm going to remain open-minded to whatever we find. And like I say, there could be a third option we haven't thought of yet. But if we find that the world next door to us was blue as well for a long time, literally that it would look different in the sky, it would look like a bright blue star instead of a bright, you know, cream star. Mm. There's some kind of something tragically fascinating about yeah. that. And it paints the idea of a world gone wrong with potential lessons for our own world. Mm. Maybe we'll find that Venus was always shafted, in which case then we've got a much better handle of actually making sense of what we see in other stars. Yeah. But if we find, you know, evidence for sediments or something like that, and sometimes it might be one image will do it, that changes everything. Yeah. Not just for Venus, but for how we make sense of Earth as well. So maybe we'll uh, we'll end up looking for the stromatolites on Venus in the, the mission. I like to wind my friends up that we'll find the limestone beds. But I do that to wind them up. <laughs> I don't think they'll find limestone. But if we did... Yeah, I mean, these are the kinds of questions we have to ask. And it might be too, and this is a, this is what these missions will help us understand. It may be that Venus was in fact Earth-like for a long time, but no rock from that era is preserved because of the amount of stuff that's happened since. And that's okay too. We just need to make sure, we, we need to make sense of what's there. That's the first thing. And then we go from there. But like I say, if we were to show ultimately that there were two blue marbles in the, in the solar system at the same time, that would be big. Amazing. Paul, that's so fascinating. I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to go through that with us. Um, My before, pleasure. Thank you very much. Before we go, uh, where can people keep up with the work that you're doing, um, the ideas that you're putting out? I, I know you're uh, active on Twitter, always posting little interesting things and papers and, and ideas. Where, where should people go to find out what Professor right, so Paul definitely. Burns is doing today? You can track me on Twitter at the Planetary Guy. That will uh, uh, you'll find me there. I do I do try and spread the good word on Venus. Uh, uh, really, any any world they're all interesting, and um, but definitely Twitter. And, and I find that quite an effective platform to reach people, including other scientists and policymakers, but certainly p members of the public who are just interested in this stuff. Um, and and honestly, just keeping up with, with news uh, through Google or whatever method you use to consume space related news. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about Venus in the coming years because these missions are under development and they will spur on other countries to do things. And yeah. We already know right now that the Indian Space Research Organization is talking about developing its own Venus orbiter. So you'll hear more and more about Venus. I'll bring that to people as I can as I hear about it. Um, of course, we also have Europa Clipper and we have Dragonfly and we have a bunch of other really... We've got humans going back to the moon, hopefully in the next mm -hmm. few years. This is an amazing time to be in or adjacent to or watching what's happening in planetary and human exploration. So follow me at The Planetary Guy um, and, and just keep your eye on the news and see what happens. Amazing. All those links will be down in the description. So head over there and follow what Paul's doing and keep up with uh, all of the new planetary research that's happening. Paul, thank you so much again for taking the time to go through that with us. I thought that was absolutely excellent. There's one comment in the chat that I thought be might, might be uh, worth finishing with. Um, from protagonist, he says, maybe ancient Venusians sent out a bioprobe to transform Earth once they realized that they were shafted. Final thoughts on that, Paul, before we close up. I'll say this. Um, so we have no evidence for intelligent life anywhere else in the universe yet. But I can also tell you that if you have a large world that's the same size as Earth, and if it was like the same conditions as Earth, and Earth developed life, and probably fairly early on, although the rock record is ambiguous on that count, then for all the same building blocks, why wouldn't Venus have? Seems like an obvious question to me. So I guess it massively if, changes our priors as to how likely life might be to develop on, on extrasolar planets as well. That's something I think that's going to, I think, it, yeah, within our lifetimes, 
we're going to learn something really fundamental about the universe, I think. We are going to find evidence for life or we won't. And and I think the best chance humans have of finding intelligent life, some body like us, isn't a radio signal, although I think we should listen. But I think if we were to see evidence for, say, lights on the night side of an exoworld, mm that we could definitively say aren't because of forest fires, let's say. Although if it's forest fires, <laughs> you've got forests, which is life. But I mean, like, you know, some people have made light because they don't see in the dark. Mm. That would be, to me, like, you know, even if they are tens of light years away, and you know, or hundreds of light years away, we never get to meet them. We're, we, we know we're not alone. Um, missions to Europa, to Enceladus, to Mars, mm. Ceres, asteroids, if we find stuff there, then I think what we're going to learn, and this is my hunch, that life is really easy to make. Mm. I think it's probably much more difficult. This is just, again, speaking from my own hunt, faith. Yeah. I don't have any evidence of this. <laughs> but my, my gut tells me that life is easy to get going, and it's extremely difficult to keep going. Yeah. And that you might have a scenario for even a relatively short period of time. And again, 10 million years is very short geologically. That's quite a long time biologically for things to produce and develop and evolve. Um, but how you maintain geologically clement conditions for life is a big question that we are asking. And if you told me that in 100 years time we have shown that in fact Venus was inhabited and there were crawlies swimming around in its early oceans, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I'd be really amazed, but I'd be like, OK, I get that because that's what Earth had. And then that leads to the question of whether or not what happened to Venus is unlucky mm. or maybe what happened to Earth and its ability to remain habitable for f certainly three and a half billion years and likely longer is some fluke. Mm. And maybe it's not all that common that either way, that's going to be a massive advance in our understanding of what we might expect out there. Uh, either way, the answer is going to have incredible outcomes. So understanding the evolution of these planets, it's not just about understanding a ball of rock it's about understanding those um time scales and the ability for life itself to develop on on some of these worlds so it's it's linked Absolutely. into a hell of a lot of massive questions that we'd it's we'd all like connected it's yeah. all connected yeah. paul again i've said it twice now but i'll say it again thank you so much for taking the time thanks and uh fun. hopefully when the next thing that's relevant to this comes up we can get you back and we can uh we can have another fascinating chat it's been great you bet. happy to do it have a Thanks, great man. afternoon and uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Cheers. Thanks, buddy. Bye now.